Oh yeah, hallelujah. Hey baby. <laughs> All right, praise the Lord. All right, glory. I thought that's what you said, but I, oh my goodness. Yeah, for all of you guys that, uh, I know you can't see online, you say, what in the world are they doing there? Well, we have all of our children and our little small ones go out, so we'll give them a second. Yeah, 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 yeah. Praise the Lord for nursery workers and God bless the children's workers. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord is all I can say. How about you? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, uh, being what the Lord wants you to be, and a, a lot of the, the, especially the chorus of the song that we just finished is High King of Heaven, is about all praise to the Lord Most High, all praise to the one who saved my life, all praise to Jesus Christ, High King forever, my Lord forever, High King of Heaven, my Lord forever. Uh, this acknowledges the fact that he does have a life for us to live and that Living that life is the real challenge of the Christian life. What, what happened when you got saved? Well, the Lord entered your life. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. And you're inspired and you're led and God speaks to you and he gives you wisdom and, and, and you make decisions and choices. And he uses you and what his purpose for you is to affect the people in your life and, and your world and the world around you. Now, the most difficult part of the whole thing is, of course, the struggle that we are constantly in to, um, to be who we are. So if you are a complicated person, I just want you to recognize that you're in good company because to be who you are is is a real struggle in life, and the first enemy that we're going to face is a very formidable enemy. He's very tenacious. Uh, everybody say, it's all about me. <laughs> yeah, I am the enemy of my own life. Uh, I'm the most difficult person to get by, the most difficult enemy, if I'm going to be the person that God intended for me to be. And, one of, we're, and so we're gonna look at uh, a new series. This is called The Pretender. And it's all, about, um, it's all about basically being who God created you to be and the struggle with that. And we're gonna go into the Bible and we're gonna use the most complex, conflicted person in the Bible, in my opinion, his story covers from Genesis 25 to Genesis, well, he says his last words to his family in Genesis 49, but he's all throughout the Old Testament because his name is a constant and all of us know him and it's the most complicated, conflicted person by the name of Jacob. Jacob, could, Jacob really is almost, you, whether good or bad, if you wanna illustrate something in life, Jacob is your man. He is uh, very complex reminds me so much of us and all of the struggles that he has. So let's look at his life and let's see if God can show us some things about, uh, about being who we are and who God created us to be. And, and just so just hang on, that may not sound all that exciting. And you say, well, I know I'm who I am. I'm not afraid to be who I am. Well, let's just see. All right, let's make some observations. Let's let the Lord speak through the life of Jacob. Uh, Genesis 32, we're gonna begin right there. Genesis 32, this is not... Uh, we're gonna go back and get all the different things that happened in Jacob's life because they're all extremely instructive uh, about our lives and what God does in us. But let me just kind of get us an overview and get us going today. All right, Genesis 32. In Genesis 32, verse 22, this is one of the major events that happens in Jacob's life. It happens toward the end of his life, but uh, we'll jump in here and then kind of work back a little bit today. Verse 22, and he arose that night, and he took his two wives. I told you he was conflicted, right? All right. And we're gonna look at these two wives. We're gonna look at all about that. We're gonna see them several times, so forth. But he took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. Now, this doesn't have anything to do with, this, with actually some spiritual instruction, but I, I've read this verse so many times through the years, and I've just read the ford of Jabbok. This week, it, it, I just said, I, I, I said, what is a Ford? 
You know, I mean, what is over the Ford of Jabbok? So I, I looked at it, and what a Ford is, is a, I, I always thought it just meant like a little creek, you know, like a little branch off of it. But what a Ford is, is a shallow place in a river where the water runs pretty fast, but you can still cross over the river. So a ford is a place where you can actually go across the river is all it actually is. All right, hopefully that'll bless your life. See, at least get some of your money's worth. All right, here we go. And uh, he, verse 23, he took them and he sent them over the brook and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone. Now this is often where God does his best work, right? When, when we're left alone. When, uh, when there's no distractions there, uh, the opinions of others are not there, even the comforts of other people, the distractions of other people, they're, they're not there. God can touch you in your deepest places when he touches you and you're alone. And here's what happens. And a man, did I put man up there? I probably left it in. And a man, yeah. Now you see it's capitalized, right? Now you know what that means. It, the word used there is the word for a masculine figure. That's what it is, as opposed to a feminine figure, not just some person like a, a, man, a man like me and you, flesh and And the reason it's capitalized is because you'll see this is more than just a man. This actually is God in a human form, and in the Old Testament, you know, in the, in the, in the New Testament, we called him Jesus. But in the Old Testament, he's called a theophany. That's what he's called. When God appears in the flesh, flesh and blood, in the Old Testament, it's a theophany. And that's who it is. This is God wrestling with, with Jacob. Um, and he wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Verse 25. Now, when, and I, I put God in, I think, yeah. Now, because it gets complicated with these he and he and he and he and he and he. I, I just changed it to, to God's name and Jacob's name. I'll just read them that way. Now, when God saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, God touched the socket of Jacob's hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as God wrestled with him. And God said, let me go for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And God said to him, what is your name? That's always been something I've noticed. Uh, I'm thinking, don't you think God knows his name? I mean, don't you think God knows who he's wrestling with? You, it, it's not as if God was just ambling by and, uh, and just couldn't resist the temptation to mug a tourist, you know. I mean, he, sure he knows who he's wrestling with. But he says, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And God said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Now, this is the first time in the scripture where the name Israel occurs. This is the first time that name is ever used. And God changes Jacob's name to Israel. Then Jacob asked saying, tell me your name, I pray. And God said, why is it that you ask about my name? And God blessed him there. <clears throat> and as you'll see in a latter message, uh, and God blessed him there, uh, you might not consider it such a blessing, but we'll pass by that. All right, so this is a series about the conflict that exists in all of us between uh, who we are, uh, who we want to be, uh, who we perceive our, that others think that we are. And the reason I think it's important to deal with these things is so that we can get all of that stuff out of the way, who we're supposed to be, what we're gonna be, who we hope to be, what others perceive us to be, so that we can actually become who God created us to be. The Bible is filled with conflicted characters. I mean, there are lots of them. You can go back to the very beginning of everything, and you can see the conflict in people's lives. The first two human beings that were born on the earth were Cain and Abel, the sons of Adam and Eve, and Cain killed Abel. Noah, the great man of God, and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. When he got off the ark, Noah got drunk and did some pretty freaky things, if you read them. Abraham, the father of many nations, the father of three gigantic religions in the world today. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but the, but the, but the Islamic people and the Christians and the Jews all claim Abraham as the father of their faith. 
And yet Abraham was a liar. As he was going to the, going, as God was leading him, he'd go through a land and, there, and, and Sarah was about 75 years old, 80 years old about that time. She was so beautiful that Abraham and the children of Israel, they were fearful that the king of the land might want her as his wife and would kill them in order to get him. And so Abraham would say, this is my sister. And he did it not only once, but he did it twice. Moses, the deliverer of, the, of Israel from Egyptian bondage, before he became the deliverer and led him across the Red Sea in the desert, uh, Moses was a murderer and a fugitive running from justice. David, of course, we've talked about many times, we wouldn't want even as a neighbor. He was a man after God's own heart, but he committed adultery with his neighbor's wife and then had his neighbor murdered on the battlefield and used the army as a hitman. Whew. And of course, Peter, who preached on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 souls got saved with one message on the day of Pentecost, it was just 50 days before that that Peter was warming himself around a fire and a little teenage girl said, aren't you one of those with Jesus? And he cursed her out and said, I don't even know him. Con conflicted people. I, I, just, I, I'm, I just wanted you to know that if you're a complicated person, you are in good company. And I don't want you to fall into the trap of thinking that only perfect people can play a part in God's purpose. I have said this all of my ministry life. We are way more picky than God is about who we use. We are way more judgmental and harsh about using people that aren't perfect or have some flaw in their life. Bless God, if he's divorced, he'd never be used again. Ridiculous. God is not nearly as picky as we are. And, and here's the perfect example of it. So let's, look, let's say, take some observations in this search of you. What are we gonna learn from Jacob's lives here, life here? This is gonna help us be who God created us to be. Because believe me, the masks are almost always up and we're almost always hiding something in our life. And let's just see what God says to us. All right, observation number one. Here's the first observation. There's always conflict in the womb of anything that God births into this world. If God births something into this world, there's always gonna be conflict in the, in the birthing of this thing into the world. Here, here it's a wrestling match. Jacob is standing on the, on the side of the, of, the, of the river Jabbok and he's alone and all of a sudden something grabs him from behind. Now it's, it's dark, it's night, it's in the middle of the night and Jacob doesn't know who he's wrestling with but whoever he's wrestling with is, is, is certainly tenacious and, and, and so we find Jacob in this wrestling match with God. But this is not the first time we've seen Jacob wrestling in the scripture. The first time we see Jacob wrestling in the scripture, he's not even born yet. Look in verse, at chapter 25, verse 21. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord. Isaac is Jacob's dad, by the way. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The lesson here is be careful what you pray for because you just might get it. All right, verse 22. But the children struggled together within her. Well, Miss Rebecca, looking at the sonogram, I can tell you two things about the twins that are in you. Number one, first of all, they are twins. And secondly, they're already going at it in, in the womb. And she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Sibling rivalry to the max. <laughs> These kids aren't even born yet and they're fighting inside the womb. There is always conflict in the womb of anything that God births into this world. And this is certainly symbolic of the conflict when a dream is born. 
when a, when a destiny is given, when, when, when a purpose is given by God into your life, when God births something in you, there is always conflict. The enemy's always trying to mess with it. Well, with all of this jostling and conflict in the womb, Rebecca said, if all is well, why am I like this? Basically saying what many mothers have said ever since then, why is this happening to me? So she's gone all the way from God, please let me have a baby, to God, why is this happening to me? But I love what she did. It said, so she went to inquire of the Lord. And this is a great example of what to do when we have conflict and when we have issues. Instead of taking it to our friends who know nothing, instead of taking it to our broke, our broke relatives, and you know what they're all about, instead of taking it to people who will tell us what we want to hear rather than what we need to hear, Rebecca inquires of the Lord. And why should we inquire of the Lord? Because he's the one who built us. Because he's the one who has a purpose for us. He's the only one who knows what that purpose is. And he can open me up like no one else can because he built me and he can go inside of me and show me the hidden things that are on the inside of me uh, so that I'll know what's really going on inside. Look at Genesis 20, uh, 32. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Lord speaking to Rebecca. Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger. That is a great principle. You remember that, right? That's really talking about the Holy Spirit and your old nature. But, I mean, it's, it's a shadow of that. But the two, the older shall serve the younger. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So he's the patron saint, man. Of, of all of us guys that have hair growing in all the wrong places, all right? Um, yeah, it doesn't grow up here for me. It just grows everywhere else. He's my patron saint. That's old Harry Garment. So they called his name Esau, which comes from the Hebrew word Edom, which means red. So this is very original, right? He comes out, he's covered with hair, and he's all red. Let's name him Esau, Red Harry One. Okay, that's a good name. Afterward, his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So this is the first time we see Jacob. And the first time we see Jacob, Jacob is wrestling with his brother and he's grabbed hold of his brother's heel coming, <laughs> coming out of the womb. Now, why in the world would Jacob be grabbing onto his brother's heel coming out of the womb? Well, I'm not positive, but maybe it could be because of the law of inheritance. I mean, I know most of us don't think about this, but the law of inheritance in Israel says that there is not an, an, an equal distribution of the family goods to all the children. They don't all get the same. The first child gets a double portion, gets twice as much as any of the rest of the children. And the second asset is the father's blessing which is the affirmation of the Father and the calling on to God for, to, for the, the oldest child to be blessed above measure. This was very important, by the way, because uh, God had done tremendous work and, and, and all the children knew it and Isaac knew it, and so this was a big deal. So they got the birthright, which was the stuff, and they got the blessing, okay. So Jacob is not even born yet, really. He's still in there. The only, thing is, the only part of him that's out is his hand and it's grabbed onto Esau's heel who was born first. So Jacob is already exhibiting now this, uh, this me first uh, mentality. Now, if you have trouble believing that people are selfish, it just means you don't have any children yet. And if you have trouble believing that there is a real devil, that means your children had not gotten into high school yet. The first observation here is there's always a struggle. When God births it, a dream, a vision, a destiny, a call, 
a, a, a purpose for your life, when God births it, there's always a struggle in the very birthing of it, in the womb, before it even comes out. There's this tremendous struggle to be who we are, to not, I mean, we're trying to be God first in a me first world. Is it possible to live a God first life in a me first world? Can it really even happen? Well, observation number two. Me first is a miserable ambition and ultimately doesn't work. All right. It's going to make, uh, it, it's extremely exhausting and extremely frustrating to live a me first life and above everything else, it's not going to work. It's not going to give you what you want. Uh, people are born, well, I just mentioned a minute ago, uh, all right, parents and even grandparents, you know this, when, you're, when your children were born, you, you did not have to teach them how to say uh, me, mine, and no, right? You have to teach them to say that. They just said it, born into them, born that way. What did you have to teach them to do? You had to teach them to say please, thank you, uh, share, uh, any good trait. You, you had to teach them to do. This just shows us how, how we are. We all start this way. So we're fighting a real battle here because not only do we start this way, but everything in our society and everything in our world is set up to push us toward me first. Have it your way. You deserve a break today. I mean, everything in the marketing world is marketed to me. You deserve it. It's yours. If you pay enough for it. But anyway, but that's beside the point. But Jesus told us how it worked in the kingdom of God. This is how it works in the kingdom of God. Matthew 19, look at what he said. Not many words, pretty powerful. But many who are first will be last and the last first. What's Jesus saying? Jesus is saying it's not always the ones that get ahead that actually end up ahead. You can get ahead, but can you stay ahead? I mean, it... it and I'm thinking, come on, Jesus. Come, get real, man. You had not seen Talladega Nights? You, you haven't seen Ricky Bobby's daddy peel out of the driveway? And, wh and what's he saying? If you ain't first, you last. Or Dale Earnhardt's favorite statement. Dale Earnhardt said, finishing second just means you're the first loser. So if you have, if you've tried to live this me first way, it is exhausting because it offends you every time anything's going on that's not all about you. It's a miserable way to live, miserable grabbing at heels all the time with no bigger thought in your life than what's best for me? How is this going to affect me? Disconnected from everyone around you because you are so caught up in yourself that you can't even consider anybody else in life. And ultimately... That kind of mentality doesn't work because Jesus not only said the first shall be last and the last shall be first, he also said this in Matthew 16, for what profit is it? What good does it do you? If a man shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. And I know we're thinking about he's not going to heaven, but remember what a soul is. A soul is the place of your intellect, your, your emotion, your will, your desires. It's, it's, it's the you. It's the you. It's the stuff that makes up you. You're listening to me with your soul. You're thinking about stuff with your soul. You make decisions with your soul. What is he saying here? He's saying, it's a terrible thing, and what good is it going to do you if you gain everything in the world, but you lose yourself? So Esau sells his birthright. Esau's all about me. Ja Jacob, what good is it? God said, what good is it, Jacob? If you grab after stuff, if you grab after status, if you grab after success and security, only to find that it didn't move you one step forward, it actually pushed you backwards 
because in the process of grasping after stuff and, graf- and grasping after status and success and security or any of the other S's you can put there, you lost yourself. So ultimately, me first doesn't work because I'll just remind you, Jacob was grasping Esau's heel, but he still came out second. Let's fast forward a little bit. Observation number three. When your life is centered on me first, whatever you have is not enough. We've seen baby Jake, we've seen Jakey boy, now let's see Jake the snake. Uh, All right, he's not only a heel grabber, he's a supplanter, which means a troublemaker, and he is a con man. Remember, Esau is the hairy one. Esau is the rough, tough country boy. Esau could skin a buck and run a trot line country boy. (laughs) Country boy can survive. Esau was a woodsman, an outdoorsman, a tough, rough, uh, strong person. But Jacob, according to the Bible, loved to stay among the tents, which is God's way of saying that he was somewhat of a mama's boy and um, he was certainly a little on the sissy side of life. Esau could hunt and Jacob could cook. Everybody say different. <laughs> yeah. Twins, <laughs> but different. Now, as I mentioned, there were, two important, there were two important privileges in being born first. One was the birthright, say the stuff, Stuff, everything, all the stuff, the money, the land, the property, the cattle, the the stuff is in the birthright. And the second was the blessing, which was the most important because it was the Father's affirmation of you and his prayer that God would bless your life. It was very important. Now, Esau sells his birthright to Jacob Jacob negotiates a deal with Esau, takes advantage of him at a very rough time, but Esau does make the deal to sell the birthright for a bowl of beans, which we'll look at next week. It's a real good point about that. I'll share it with you next week. But he did negotiate and he made a good deal. So Esau has has sold Jacob the birthright, so Jacob has the birthright. Jacob has the stuff, has more stuff than Esau has, but Remember, his whole life is centered on me first. And if your whole life is centered on me first, whatever you have is never enough. You always want more. Now, Jacob wants the blessing too. He's got the birthright, and now he wants the blessing. It's all, I said this to Tanya the other day. It's all about the er, the er, E-R. You know, Jacob's grandfather was Abraham, right? Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldees. And so I'm just playing off of that for just a second. And, and, and I'm just wondering if we all aren't living somewhat in the land of, of Ur. Put that C.S. Lewis quote up. Is it up there? Here's what, C.S. Lewis was a Christian philosopher. He wrote the screw tape letters. He, was, he was an atheist. He got saved. I know most Christians in somewhere has heard of C.S. Lewis. But here's what C.S. Lewis said. We don't actually take pride in the possession itself, but in having more of it than anyone else. That, that's the error of life. Uh, it's not good enough to be thin. I've got to be thin er. It's not good enough to be rich. I got to be rich er. It's not good enough to be happy. I got to be happy. It's all about the er, right? I mean, I just can't have my children being smart and everything. They have to be smart er than everybody else. So here's Jacob grabbing heels and cooking beans. And because he has to be er, There's something else that he wants. And the only thing about being er is that there is always someone else in life that is er, er. (laughs) So Jacob has the birthright. He wants the blessing. Now, let's see what's happening now. Remember, this is all about me. I can't be satisfied with what I have. I got to be er. 
Genesis 27. Now it came to pass when Isaac was old, that's their dad, and his eyes were so dim that he could not see that he called Esau his older brother and he said to him, my son, and he answered him, here I am. Now, what's about to happen here? At one time, I, I kind of felt a little sorry for Jacob on what's about to happen next. Because it seems to me that his mother, Rebecca, has a whole lot to do with this. Now, Rebecca came from a shady family herself. And you'll see her brother in just a few minutes. His name is Laban. And so she must have learned the art of deception well from her family. Everybody say, ain't genetics grand. I mean, it might be a genetic deal going on in her, but I, I used to feel sorry for Jacob because it seemed like mom manipulates him to get her purpose done, to get him blessed instead of Esau because she likes him better because he stays at the house and her, his personality and nature is more like her than Esau. Esau's always out hunting and doing stuff like that, running, skinning a buck, running a trot line, you know. And, but it, Jacob's in a house doing the stuff. So I, I, I always used to feel sorry for him until one thing, I don't know why I never noticed this. One thing. Do you know how old Jacob is when this event happens right here? Well, Jacob and Esau, because they're both the same age, they're twins. 76 years old. They are 76 years old. It's a little bit late to be blaming mama that your diapers are too tight right here, right? I mean, you gotta, sooner or later, you got to take responsibility for yourself, right? Come on, man. You did this. You're 76 years old. What in the world are you doing? And the reason I know this, and I know you say, man, 76, where'd you get that? Well, we know how old Jacob was when he appeared before Pharaoh. You remember Joseph, one of his sons got sold and they had a famine and Joseph was, was the uh, coat of many colors and he was the keeper of the grain in Egypt, second in command. And he ultimately made those boys bring their daddy down there to him. And then he reveals, hey, it's Joseph that you sold out into the, but, I, but what you intended for evil, God meant for good. That's what Joseph said. Well, the Bible tells us when Jacob is standing there in front of Pharaoh, he is 130 years old. So counting backwards, he's 76 years old when this event happens. That kind of puts a little bit of shade of light, right? <laughs> Take ownership for your own life, man. Amen. Go. All right, Genesis, uh, Genesis 27, verse 15. Uh, here's mom. Here's the scheme. You'll see what I'm talking about. Then Rebekah took the choice clothes of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house. Why does she still have Esau's clothes in the house? He's 76 years old. You 76 years old still living with your mama? No wonder they had problems. And she put them on Jacob, her younger son. So she has the clothes at her house. She just goes to the drawer, pulls them out, and puts them on Jakey Poo. And she put the skins of the kids, that's baby goats, of the goats on his hands. How hairy, how hairy is Esau? I'm thinking, if, that, if dad's going to rub that goat skin and that's going to trick him into thinking that's Esau, man, he, he was hairy, wasn't he? And on the smooth part of his neck, then she gave the savory food and the bread which she had prepared into the hands of her son, Jacob. This is elaborate, isn't it? I mean, this took some time. They didn't just think of this yesterday. This has been planned for a long time. All right, so... Verse 18, so he went to his father and he said, my father, and he said, uh, here I am, who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I'm, 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 I'm Esau, your firstborn, and I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit and eat of my game, and your soul may, that your soul may bless me. So Jacob delivers the script. Jacob is the actor. He's, he's put the line out there. He's pretending to be Esau. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? You just left. How did you get the buck and skin him and bring him back and cook him and eat? How did that happen so fast? Now, here comes the, the despicable part. This is despicable. What happens? And he said, because the Lord your God brought it to me. 
This is despicable. He's trying to be spiritual. He's trying to sound spiritual to his old blind daddy that can't see anything, who loves God, and Jacob knows he loves God. And so Jacob uses Isaac's God to be part of the lie to convince Isaac that he's really Esau. Conflicted. Complicated. <laughs> yeah. Jacob, man. Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. This is Jacob who birthed all 12 boys that are Israel, all 12 tribes. Isaac said to Jacob, please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and he said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hand. So he blessed him. So you can get so good at, um, at being someone else that not even the people that are closest to you can recognize you anymore. And he blessed him. Wow. What an indictment, really. But what they didn't count on was Esau coming back right at the end of the scheme. Before Jacob could get out of the house, here comes Esau back from hunting, and I'm going to remind you, Esau has weapons. Remember this. Esau is the hunter. Jacob is the mama's boy. Esau has weapons with him, and it's that old principle of rock, paper, scissors, right? All right, rock, uh, paper covers rock. Scissors cut paper. Um, arrows, uh, triumph, frying pan, uh, I mean, it, 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 now Jacob, so now Jacob has to run. It's like, run, Jacob, run. And Esau says, next time, don't let me ever see you again, boy, because next time I see you, I'm going to kill you. And so Rebecca, his mama, says, now would be a good time for you to go on a vacation, and you can go see my brother, Laban, yeah, and he'll take care of you. You remember Ur, Ur? Laban is Ur, Ur. Uh, he's trickier than Jacob is. He's sorrier than Jacob is. And he's a con man way better than Jacob. So it's possible to get what you want and not want what you get, right? What did Jacob want? The blessing. He bought the birthright. Esau couldn't blame anybody but himself about that. He made a bad deal. But Jacob steals, steals the blessing and so he has what he wants, but does he want what he gets? Because the blessing does not remain the blessing if you get it in the wrong way. If you have to steal to get it, if you have to deceive to get it, if you have to con to get it, the blessing is not the blessing, the blessing becomes a burden. And so Jacob is now running for his life because the blessing that he thought was going to be a blessing has now become a burden because he got it in the wrong way. Now, let me give you the fourth observation, and this is the thought, I think, that will run throughout the whole series. And here is the thought. God cannot bless who you pretend to be. Let me say that again. God cannot bless who you pretend to be. God can't bless Jacob dressed like Esau. And I completely identify with this because, you know, throughout my whole life, there have been, I've, I've been through several uh, versions of me, right? Have you? You've been through several versions of yourself. First, there's the me that is. That me frustrates me. There's the me that will be, the me I want to be, the we, me I hope to be, and this guy's incredible. If you met the me that I want to be, you would be completely blown away by him. He is unbelievable. He is extremely patient. He is, he is a, he, he's consistent in everything he does. He's kind, but he, but he can get things done. He's disciplined, but uh, in a fun-loving way, you know, in a spontaneous way. Uh, he's in amazing shape. He has an eight-pack. He doesn't even have a six. He has an eight-pack, 
And, uh, but he can eat a dessert uh, on holidays. I mean, he's, he's wonderful. You would love him. He's fantastic. So the real me is who I am. The future me is who I plan to be. So what happens in the meantime? Well, in the meantime, uh, the me you see and the me I want to be and the me that I show are really, we all develop faces and we all develop costumes. We put skins on our neck. We put Esau's clothes on. We imitate what we see others do. We wear the same brands. We talk the same talk. We, wear, we buy the same products. We try to be cool in life. So what happens to us? We learn how to be someone else. We, 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 we learn that the blessing doesn't, doesn't count for much because it causes us to lose ourselves. What good is it, Jesus said, if you gain everything in the world and you lose yourself? I mean, young ladies, uh, I, I think about this. I drive a bus during the school year and I have high school students and elementary school students and, uh, and, and the schools that I uh, pick up and deliver for don't have costumes. Uh, I mean, school uniforms, I should say, but rather than costumes, student uniforms. So they all wear what they want to wear. And I see them get on the bus every day. And I see young ladies wearing things that I know they're not comfortable with. And I'm thinking to myself, why are you wearing that if that's not you? You can tell that's not them. Well, they're wearing it because they want the attention. Well, the question is, do you want someone that that attracts to give you attention? Is that the kind of person you want to date? Is that the kind of person you want to marry? Is that the kind of person you want to be the father of your children? Somebody that would be attracted to that? You have to, you have to lower yourself to that standard to attract him. Is that the person you want in life? We lose ourselves. A young man is, uh, uh, is born and he's got a good heart. He's, he's kind. He's compassionate. He's caring in life. He goes to school. When he goes to school, he's got to learn to be hard. He's got to learn to be tough. He's got to learn to walk a certain way, squint his eyes. I mean, he has to toughen up or they'll tear him up at school. See, we, we have to learn to be somebody. We have to learn how to wear Esau's clothes. But God can't bless us dressed in Esau's clothes. Well, what good is it, Jacob? You may fool old blind Isaac, but you're not fooling yourself. And God can't bless who you pretend to be. God's not going to minister to your mask. He's not going to save your selfie. You know, he's not going to anoint your avatar. He can only bless the real you. You have the popularity. You have the money. You have the success. But you're losing yourself. Observation number five. You have found yourself when you hold on to God even when it would be easier to let go. You know, you found yourself when you hold on to God even when it would be easier for you just to let go. It takes 20 years, but Jacob finally learns a lesson from Uncle Laban. It takes 20 years, guys. Jacob learns the hard way <laughs> about this er, er stuff and this genetic tendency that he has. He worked seven years for beautiful Rachel. This was one of Laban. Laban had two daughters, Rachel that was beautiful and Leah that was not, not so much beautiful. Well, she was the oldest, Leah. Well, Jacob made a deal with Uncle Laban and said, I worked seven years for beautiful Rachel. He said, you got a deal, man. And then on their wedding night, when it came time for the honeymoon, Uncle Laban slips Leah in and takes Rachel out. And I'm thinking, how dark is it in the Middle East, really? I mean, <laughs> because, how much did he have to drink? Did he, Jesus didn't make the water at that wedding, wine at that wedding, did he? The best stuff. But when he woke up in the morning, Jacob wakes up and he looks over in the bed with him and the Bible, I love the way the Bible puts it. Behold, it was Leah. <laughs> you know? And 
And Uncle Laban says, all right, you work seven more years and you can have beautiful Rachel. So he worked seven more years for beautiful Rachel. Now he's, now he's 14 years into this thing and he's got Rachel and Leah. And then he has to work six more years until, find God, until finally God gives him a, 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 a vision and a dream about putting sticks and striping them and spotting them. This will be a message too in this series. And putting them in front of them and they see them and they start having speckled and spotted sheep. And then Jacob made a deal, I'll take all the speckled and spotted sheep. And he ends up richer than Laban, more prosperous than Laban. He's erred the er, er now. And Laban says, boy, you gotta go. You got to get out of here. You ain't got to go home, but you got to get on up out of here. And of course, Jacob's first thought now turns to what? He says, all right, go home, boy. You can't stay here anymore. So the first thought that pops into Jacob's mind would be what? What would pop into your mind? I wonder if Esau softened up. I wonder if Esau, you know, last time I saw Esau, what he said? He said, I'm going to kill you. I wonder if he softened up a bit. I wonder if I'm going, when I go back home, can I go back home and live to tell about it? That's what he's basically saying. And, and on his way back home, in the middle of the night, no street lights, no flashlights, no nothing, black as midnight. He's standing there on one side of the creek. That, what does that say? He still ain't got it. He's still crafty. He's still a con man living by his wits. You know what he's doing. He sent his 11 boys, two wives, maid servants, sheep, goats, flock, everything over to the other side, the Esau side, so that if Esau did come, he would get to them first and maybe before he could get all through them and get over here, he would change his mind about killing him. He's left alone on this side and everybody else. He's still living by his wits. He hadn't changed a bit. He'd been running around for 20 years talking about, I saw God coming down out of stairs in a mountain at Bethel. And he hadn't changed one iota. He, he, he saw God, but he's, he's never seen himself. And then God grabs him right in the middle of the night can't see him. Who do you think Esau thought, I mean, who do you think Jacob thought it was? Oh, Esau's got me. Oh, he snuck up on me, took a, took a play out of my own book. <laughs> and God just wrestles with him, wrestles with him. Now, when you think about that event of Jacob wrestling with God at Jabbok, how old, now, you know, you've read that before, you've heard that story before. How old do you think he was? I mean, before today, when I told you before. Uh, you, I'm thinking he's 25, 30 years old. I'm thinking he's a pretty young guy, you know. I, I don't know why I thought that, but that's just kind of the picture in my mind, man. And he's wrestling with a young guy. But let me, let, me, let me do some math for you. Now, this is public school math, so all right, take that into account. It's not common core, but it's public school, so let's see if we can do it. All right, how old was he when he conned, when he, when he, when he conned his old blind daddy out of the blessing? He was how old? 76. All right, he stays with Laban 20 years. So 70 plus 20, 76 plus 20 is what? 96. No wonder his hip went out of joint. He's 96 years old, wrestling with an angel at Jabbok. And, 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 and this is poetic justice, really. This, this is poetic justice because Jacob spends his whole life grabbing everything. And now something has grabbed him, right? And, uh, and so Jacob is wrestling and, 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 and this basically, this is the grace of God. The grace of God grabs old Jacob. I know it doesn't look like it. It looks like a problem. But this is God's way of changing Jacob. And I, I, let me show you. I, I'm almost finished. Genesis 32. This is verse 26. And God said, let me go for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I think you could safely say that you have found yourself when you hold on to God, even when it would be easier to let go, right? Sometime, sometime in your life, you have to decide, 
I'm not going to let this go. This is, this is important. This is significant. This is, this is life changing. This matters. And I'm not going to let it go. Jacob said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Jacob said, I've been holding on to stuff all of my life. I've been, I, I was born holding on to Esau. I've held on to pride. I've held on to popularity. I've held on to success. I've held on to all of these, this, all this heel grabbing. I've grabbed heels every day of my life. But now I'm holding on to the real thing. And I will not let you go. Because you're someone, I sense that you're someone who can really bless me. And I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And then it gets weird. Verse 27, God asks, what is your name? Again, God is omniscient. He knows everything. He knows who he's wrestling with. But we've heard this question before, haven't we? Back years ago, 20 years ago, didn't we hear the same question when he was standing at the door and his old blind daddy said, who is it? And he said, I'm Esau. So for 21 years, Isaac has been carrying the blessing, but it's not his blessing. It's Esau's blessing. Now this time, Jacob says, I want my own blessing. I don't want to be blessed as Esau. I want to be blessed as to who I am. And in verse 27, after, the, after God asked him, what's your name? Jacob answered, my name is Jacob. My name is heel grabber. My name is con man. My name is deceiver. My name is trickster. My name is, 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 is pain. I was named that from the womb and I've been carrying that name my whole life. And I know you can bless me as Jacob. It's like God said, I see who you pretend to be, but who are you really? Jacob says, I'm ready to take Esau's clothes off. I'm ready to let go of heels. Uh, 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 I, 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 my, my, game, my own games are getting old to me and I'm tired of playing all these games. And when he finally admits who he is, in verse 28, God says, you are no longer Jacob, but you are Israel, which leads me to the last observation. And that is, once you admit your old name, God can give you a new one. Jacob got a new name, right? You're not Jacob anymore. You're Israel, which means prince with God, wrestler with God, triumphant with God is literally what Israel means. So you got a brand new name. And how, why did he get a brand new name? Because he struggled. If he'd have let go, he wouldn't have gotten a new name. He got the new name because he struggled. So it's not always your successes. It's not always your, 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 your accomplishments in which God blesses your life. Listen to this. Most often it is in your struggles that God allows you to see yourself and puts you in line that he can do something in your life. And aren't you glad God gives you a new name? Hey, I got saved uh, 40-something years ago. I came to the Lord. When I came to the Lord, the Lord changed me. And when he changed me, he, he gave me a new name for a new start. He doesn't call me what I used to be. He calls me what I am in Christ. He calls me, he doesn't call me sinner, reprobate, outlaw, uh, liar, stealer, con man. He doesn't call me any of that. God changed my name. He changed me and he calls me by that name. He doesn't call me what I used to be. He calls me what my new name is. Redeemed, forgiven, loved, overcomer, champion. No longer is he going to be Jacob, heel grabber. Now he's Israel. He's triumphant with God. That's his new identity. So you would think for the rest of his life, he would be called by his new name, Israel. But if you read about his life, you will find that sometimes he's called Jacob 
And sometimes he's called Israel. So why would God give him a new name and then not use it all the time? Because change is complicated, right? Just because you have a new name doesn't mean that I'm not gonna have the same struggles that I have. Everybody say crisis. Yeah, we all, I mean, just because I get a new name doesn't mean that, that I'm never gonna have any struggles anymore. I'm gonna have lots of crisis in life. This may take a while. I'm still working on it 47, 48 years later, and I'm sure I will till Jesus comes and gets me or I go to him. That's right. Your name is Israel, but sometimes it's Jacob that pops up because we have conflicting natures. Do you know that when you get saved, God doesn't kill your old nature? He just puts a new nature inside of you. So now you got two natures. You got an old one and you got a new one. And God said, let the new one win. Feed the new one. Let the new one get big and strong and it'll take care of the old one. But we still have conflicts within ourselves. And we have conflicting natures. But God is not intimidated by conflict. It does not intimidate God that you fail at times. That you have struggles at times. How do you know? Well, Jacob asked God about his, about, about his name. You know, he said, I'm not going to let you go to bless me. And, and then uh, Jacob said, and by the way, what's your name? And God said, God didn't say anything. He just didn't tell him his name. He said, just blessed him. And now you'll see what that is in a few weeks. Because, why did that happen? Because the angel was there. God was there to show Jacob who Jacob was, not to expose who he is. Jacob had, by the way, met God 21 years earlier, like I mentioned a moment ago. When he was on his way to Uncle Laban's house, he, lay, he got at a wide spot in the road called Bethel. He laid his head on a rock cause I, as a pillow, and he went to sleep, and he had a dream, and he saw uh, heavens open and a ladder came out out of heaven and he saw angels going up it and angels going down it. And when he got up, it made such a, this is, this is powerful. It made such a powerful impact on him that when he got up, he immediately started to tithe. I'm serious, he did. He immediately started to tithe right there on the spot. You know a man's got to be saved to do that, right? So anyway, he did. And, and, and so, and so, uh, for, tw for 21 years, or for 20 years at least, he's 96 years old. Tw for 21 years, he met God, but he never met himself. He's 96 years old now, running around, and he's never met himself. He's never met Jacob. He saw God, but so what? He doesn't treat anybody any differently. He doesn't act any differently. He still, he, he still cons people, cheats people, and, and, and pl tries to play confidence games on them. And he's running around talking about seeing God coming down you know, on a, from a stairway in heaven. But he's not different. He hasn't changed. So he met Jacob in the wrestling match. What is your name? Are you still Esau? I'm Jacob. I said, I can work with that. So many years later, just follow this just a second. I'm, I'm finished. Many years later, Jacob's dead, and Jacob's lineage, the 12 tribes of Israel, are enslaved in Egypt. They, they never left. When they came down there to get grain, uh, they never left. And Israel made, uh, Egypt made slaves out of them. And so for 400 years, they're slaves. And after 400 years, God appears in a bush that's on fire to an 80-year-old shepherd who's on the backside of nowhere, the backside of the desert. And here's what God says to him, Exodus 3. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, 
And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. The God of your fathers, Abraham, the God of your father, Isaac, and the God of your father, Jacob. Wouldn't you expect God to say, the God of, Isaac, uh, the God of Israel? That's Jacob's good side, by the way. So if you're trying to make a good impression on people, wouldn't you want to use Jacob's good name rather than his old bad name? What's God doing? God's saying, if you want to know who I am, I'm the God of Jacob too. I'm not only the God of your successes. I'm the God of your struggles. I'm the God of, the part, of that part of you that you don't want anybody to see. I'm not just the God of somebody that when you're sitting in the church and singing spiritual songs and looking all nice and clean, I'm that God when you're out there doing stuff that you don't want anybody to know about or see. I'm not just the God of your victories. I'm the God of your, uh, of your defeats, the God of your struggles. So what is your name? What is the Holy Spirit saying to us? It's time to be real with who we are, with what we are, with what God has called us. See, it is so easy to hide from yourself. And that's the most important person to know who you are and what you are. God can bless you. God wants to bless you, but he can't bless you pretending to be somebody else. And it's extremely important. I hope you grasp that. We'll, we'll look at it four or five more messages, five or six more messages. Jacob's life is full of stuff. So we'll look at it and he's a, we'll ask God to preach to us about this because this is a tremendous, there's tremendous urgency in that and to me, to me. All right, stand your feet, will you? Just bow your heads.